evening, church family. Good evening. And I am very pleased that I remember to say evening and not morning. <laughs> I don't have much in the way of announcements tonight except to say that I am so glad to see all of you here and to make sure everyone has gotten their candle for the candle lighting portion at the end of our service and their individual communion pod for the communion portion of our service. If you still need them, they are right in the parlor as you come in. Now, if you've been here at any point since we reopened, you've used these nice, little bit safer communion pods before, but just in case anyone hasn't and is not quite sure how they work, there's a clear part on the top, that cellophane, you peel that off and that will release your wafer, and there's a foil part that you peel off to release your grape juice, which is in the cup. Any questions or anyone worried about how to use these? Little fun tip, if you think it might take you a minute or two to peel them open, it's good to do it during the communion anthem. It gives you some time. <laughs> and so friends, let's let the chimes bring us into worship on this holiest of nights. Oh, 
room full of voices singing after I spent last Christmas Eve filming in an empty sanctuary. This is much better. Our last four weeks we have lit each candle on our wreath, peace, hope, love, and joy in anticipation of the fulfillment of those promises. The time is now, and so we complete our wreath with the Christ candle, because the light of the world is born for you and me and all people. Let's <laughs> sing the baby's arrival. Father, Prince of Peace. 
His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this and will respond to each reading in song.
the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. <coughs>
handbell choir to have our handbells back out and in use is a special gift and a special thanks to the volunteer who helped us get them back in working order. If we listen to uh, the commercials that have been playing since about late October, they'd have us believe that the most vital part of our holiday season is finding the perfect gift. Preferably, of course, whatever that particular commercial is trying to sell, whether that's the latest cell phone model or Peloton's fancy exercise bike or a brand new car. And well, of course, we have to take these commercials whose sole purpose is to sell us their product with a significant helping of salt, they kind of have a point. The tradition of exchanging gifts during Christmas season stretches back to at least the fourth century, meaning that it's been around since the early church. And there is a certain thrill around the best gift. Sometimes that means receiving the best gift. Most of us, I'm sure, can remember the excitement of Christmas morning as children, tearing the wrapping paper apart to find the year's hottest toy. And even as adults, we can get excited over getting the gift we've been hoping for. And on the flip side, well, sometimes the thrill of the best gift is about giving it, about the spark of inspiration when you're browsing the aisles or the Amazon listings and you see something that's just right for your best friend or your sibling or your significant other about the satisfaction when you watch someone open up what you got them and their eyes light up because it's unexpected and yet so very them. There really is something special about the best gift. The original Christmas gift, of course, is the nativity itself. The birth of Jesus, God made flesh, Emmanuel. When we read the scriptures in which the church looks forward to and back on the Christmas story, there is a definite sense of that specialness. The prophet Isaiah proclaims that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light and lists all the magnificent titles by which that light shall be known. When the first generations of Christians read these words, they declare them a prediction of Jesus' arrival, that Isaiah's lofty promise of endless peace and justice and righteousness is fulfilled by the nativity story. And a handful of decades after the life of Jesus, a letter to someone named Titus reflects on the wonder of Christ's appearance, the salvation it brings, and the responsibilities to which we are called as a result of such graciousness. It's Jesus who gives himself to redeem us and who is our hope, who is God's grace incarnate. Another grand proclamation of how the nativity and all that follows is the original best gift from God to all of us.
But in the actual account of the Nativity, in the story Luke's Gospel records, the specialness is much harder to find. Yeah, there are angels who sing glory to God, but the only ones who see them are the shepherds. Shepherds who have one of the worst jobs in their society, who wouldn't be welcome at anyone's dinner table. They're the least special people the angels could have made the announcement to. Mary and Joseph end up in a stable which was probably inside a cave because they couldn't find anywhere else to go. Just Mary and Joseph cleaning blood and fluid off their newborn and putting him among the hay because that's the warmest place for him while his exhausted, sore mother rests for a minute. <clears throat> the only well-wishers they get besides the animals are those stinky shepherds peeking curiously into the makeshift cradle and telling them about the terror of seeing the angelic messengers. And all of this is taking place in a little backwater village where nothing interesting has occurred for over a thousand years. A baby is born in a cave in a town that barely registers on the maps and the only people who care are his parents and the local outcasts. The world doesn't notice. Nothing special happening here. Luke's account of Jesus' birth tells of the least lofty circumstances possible. It is the opposite of grand, the simplest and sparest of occasions. It isn't until later that people would realize what that birth in the stable cave was. Not until later that we would understand the specialness of the moment, the grandeur of God breaking into human history, a great light in dark little Bethlehem. Not until later that we would wonder at the grace of God who becomes human, who offers God's self as a helpless infant, all to save us. As it turns out, we don't always see the best gift for what it is. Sometimes it takes us a while to see the specialness of a moment that seems so very ordinary. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given as the carol goes. As you leave here tonight to exchange your Christmas presents and gather around good food, you may or may not give or get what you think is the best gift. But try to find the wonder in those seemingly ordinary pieces of your holiday before the morning coffee, in between the visiting relatives, after the leftovers have been packed up. Think back to that cave in Bethlehem and how the world didn't even blink as God tested human lungs for the first time. The best gifts, the 
the best gifts unfurl the wonder of God's love in the simplest of special moments. Alleluia. Amen. And as we uh, celebrate that simplest and most special moment, I invite you to uh, join me in the responsive Christmas prayer in your bulletins. Emmanuel, we've waited until the moment when that name rings truest. May God this take on his fullest meaning. That moment has arrived. We celebrate you, O saving one, on the seed of your birth. Uncreated, yet you are born of creation. Eternal, yet you walk the span of mortal years. Infinite, yet you have been bound in flesh, tender and tiny. We thank you always, but with special joy tonight, that you joined humankind as one of us, not for your sake, but for ours. Thank you for being our all in all, even as you lay in stable, beating the Amen. Meditate on the ordinary special moments in your holiday as you listen to our offertory. <coughs> Thank you. 
as we care for our communion <coughs> service. We know that God is present in our meal here long before it reaches us, just as in that Bethlehem stable, the ordinary is made holy here in our caring. We lift up in gratitude the infinite love of Christ, rejoicing in the miracle of God come to dwell with us in flesh. We declare, as Jesus did, that all seekers are welcome at this table, as we remember the devotion of Joseph, the labor of Mary, the song of the angels, and the witness of the shepherds, all of which testify to our one faith under one God, who makes possible our sharing in this one table of divine love.
arrived in a lowly stable, born of Mary, our sister in faith, the baby Jesus grew and lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to serve and to save, because the Christmas story leads with certainty to the Easter story, with all the faithful everywhere we sing together.
light with which you flooded the world at your birth continue to sustain us as we go forth into Christmas and beyond. Amen. The ushers will come forward and take light to me, and they will bring light to the person on the end in the center of each pew. This is your fire safety reminder to only tip unlit candles, please. And we will sing Silent Night as the light spreads.
born. God is here, sleepy and soft and squirmy. The Savior is here. As you go out to your celebrations, carry with you the wonders of God's love and repeat the sounding joy. Peace and goodwill be to all of us. Hallelujah. Amen.